Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Shaws. Today we have the second half of Black Looks and Bright Swords, the sixth tale from Waverly. And next week, we're going to have the last week of our stories from Waverly. And that means we have a decision coming up. That is, after we're completed with Waverly, should we either continue down the path of Red Cap Tales with the second retelling, Guy Mannering, or if we should head over to L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz and his American Fairy Tales. If you head over to folktaleprojects.com or over to twitter.com slash folktaleproject, we'll have a little survey there for you to let me know which way you'd like to go. But, for the time being, here is part two of Black Looks and Bright Swords. It was not long before the poor prince had a further proof of this fact. On the 5th of December, after a council at Derby, the Highland chiefs, disappointed that the country did not rally all about them, and that the government forces were steadily increasing on all sides, compelled the prince to fall back towards Scotland. Fergus MacIver fiercely led the opposition to any retreat. He would win the throne for his prince, or if he could not, then he and every son of Ivor would lay down their lives. That was his clear and simple plan of campaign. But he was easily overborne by the numbers, and when he found himself defeated in council, he shed actual tears of grief and mortification. From that moment, Vicky and Vor was an altered man. Since the day of the quarrel, Edward had seen nothing of him. It was therefore with great surprise that he saw Fergus one evening enter his lodgings and invite him to take a walk with him. The chieftain smiled sadly as he saw his old friend take down his sword and buckle it on. There was a great change in the appearance of Vicky and Vor. His cheek was hollow, his eye burned as if with fever. As soon as the two men had reached a beautiful and solitary glen, Fergus began to tell Edward that he had found out how wrong-headed and rash he had been in the matter of their quarrel. Flora writes me, continued Fergus, that she never had and never could have the least intention of giving you any encouragement. I acted hastily, like a madman. Waverly hastily entreated him to let all be forgotten, and the two comrades-in-arms shook hands and this time heartily and sincerely. Notwithstanding, the gloom on the chief's brow was scarcely lightened. He even besought Waverley to betake himself at once out of the kingdom by any eastern port to marry Rose Bradwardine and to take Flora with him as a companion to Rose and also for her own protection. Edward was astonished at this complete change in Fergus. What? he cried. Abandon the expedition on which we have all embarked? Embarked, answered the chief bitterly. Why, man? The expedition is going to pieces. It's time for all those who can to get ashore in the longboat. And what, said Edward, are the other Highland chiefs going to do? Oh, the chiefs, said Fergus contemptuously. They think that all the heading and hanging will, as before, fall to the lot of the lowlands, and that they will be left alone in their poor and barren highlands to listen to the wind on the hill till the waters abate. But they will be disappointed. The government will make sure work this time, and leave not a clan in all the highlands able to do them hurt. As for me, it will not matter. I shall either be dead or taken by this time tomorrow. I have seen the Bladock class, the grey spectre. Edward looked the surprise he could not speak. Why, continued Fergus in a low voice, were you so long about Glenachiac and yet never heard of the Bladock cause? The story is well known to every son of Ivor. I will tell it to you in a word. My forefather, Ian Nan Chistel, wasted part of England along with a lowland chief named Halbert Hall. After passing the Shevets on their way back, they quarreled about dividing of the spoil, and from words came speedily to blows. In the fight, the lowlanders were cut off to the last man, and their leader fell to my ancestor's sword. But ever since that day, the dead man's spirit has crossed the chief of Clan Ivor on the eve of any great disaster. My father saw him twice. 
once before he was taken prisoner at Sheriff Muir, and once again on the morning of the day on which he died. Edward cried out against any such superstition. How can you, he said, you who have seen the world believe such child's nonsense as that? Listen, said the chief, here are the facts and you can judge for yourself. Last night I could not sleep for thinking on the downfall of all my hopes for the cause, for the prince, for the clan. So, after lying long awake, I stepped out into the frosty air. I had crossed a small footbridge and was walking backward and forward when I saw clear before me in the moonlight a tall man wrapped in a gray plaid such as the shepherds wear. The figure kept regularly about four yards from me. That is an easy riddle, exclaimed Edward. Why, my dear Fergus, what you saw was no more than a Cumberland peasant in his ordinary dress. So I thought at first, answered Fergus, and I was astonished at the man's audacity in daring to dog me. I called to him but got no answer. I felt my heart beating quickly, and, to find out what I was afraid of, I turned and faced first north, then south, east, and west. Each way I turned, I saw the gray figure before my eyes at precisely the same distance. Then I knew. I had seen the buttock glass. My hair stood up, and so strong an impression of awe came upon me that I resolved to return to my quarters. As I went, the spirit glided steadily before me till we came to the narrow bridge where it turned and stood waiting for me. I could not wade the stream, and I could not bring myself to turn back. So, making the sign of the cross, I drew my sword and cried aloud, In the name of God, evil spirit, give place! Vicky and Vor, it said in a dreadful voice, beware of tomorrow. It was then within a half a yard of my sword's point, but as the words were uttered, it was gone. There was nothing either on the bridge or on the way home. All is over. I'm doomed. I have seen the buttock glass, the curse of my house. Edward could think of nothing to say in reply. His friend's belief in the reality of the vision was too strong. He could only ask to be allowed to march once more with the sons of Ivor who occupied the post of danger in the rear. Edward easily obtained the baron's leave to do so, and when the clan MacIver entered the village he joined them, once more arm in arm with their chieftain. At the sight, all the MacIver's ill feeling was blown away in a moment. Heaven do received him with a grin of pleasure, and... The imp Callum, with a great patch on his head, appeared particularly delighted to see him. But Waverley's stay with the clan Ivor was not to be long. The enemy was continually harassing their flanks, and the rear guard had to keep lining hedges and dikes in order to beat them off. Night was already falling on the day which Fergus had foretold would be his last, when in a chance skirmish of outposts, the chief and a few followers found himself surrounded by a strong attacking force of dragoons. A swift eddy of the battle threw Edward out to one side. The cloud of night lifted, and he saw Evan Dew and a few others, with the chieftain in their midst, desperately defending themselves against a large number of dragoons who were hewing at them with their swords. It was quite impossible for Waverley to break through to their assistance. Night shut down immediately, and he found it was equally impossible for him to rejoin the retreating Highlanders, whose war pipes he could still hear in the distance. And that is the second part of Black Looks and Bright Swords, where we're really seeing the kind of horrors of this war, this engagement. But at the least, we have our Edward and Fergus MacIver have come to an understanding, an agreement, and a reconciliation. Although Fergus is certain that he's doomed on the following day. So next week, we will pick back up with the last three stories. The first being a very short interlude. In fact, it is called the interlude of brevity. And then the last tale from Waverly, again broken into two parts. This is Dan Scholes of the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com, where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening.